Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, when Jesus was going to his home country, his own, his own place where he lived, and uh, he was not well received there because they said, isn't this guy just the carpenter? And they said in verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. This is the Jude in uh, Mark chapter 6 and in John chapter 7. That was the brother of of our Lord Jesus. And so when we read our introduction, I want us to keep that in mind as we begin in verse 1 of chapter 10. Somebody's going to look up and say something in a minute. <laughs> I think Stacy did right away. There's no Jude chapter 10. Well, uh, Jude. In Jude chapter 1, and we'll begin reading, and we'll read down to um, verse 3. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Well, let's pray. We'll uh, make that our text this evening. We'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. God, I ask that this evening as we see this exhortation from Jude who became a believer and who was clearly called to serve you, Lord, I ask that you would help us to see how it is that we can contend for the faith and God, very importantly, how that we can keep from falling. God, I just pray that your word would be very clear tonight, very plain to us, and so that we could be helped by it, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Jude is one of the greatest, uh, one of the passages or uh, books of the scripture that is the most greatly devoted to warning about false teaching, more so than any other book. Just about every single one of the epistles from both Paul and from Peter and uh, even uh, the book of the Revelation from John, there are warnings to the church to beware of false doctrine, to beware of apostasy or turning away. But Jude seems to involve a great deal of warning against false teaching, and it gives some keys to the saved on how to contend for the faith and how to keep for, from falling. I just really want to preach a message this evening on that, how to contend for the faith and how to keep from falling. How do we keep from failing as a Christian? I don't know about you, but I think that if we were honest here this evening, every one of us would say that at some time in our Christian life, as we have been running the race, we have failed. We have fallen, and at least, at the very least, we would have to say before God that we have not always been everything that we should have been. And so, uh, this to me, I think, is a not only a good warning, but a fair warning that is, I want it to be, uh, that is something that I need. I need to learn and I need to know. I want to say also, uh, as well as this, that if you will study the book of Jude, you'll find that one of the warnings against false teachers, and almost every warning about false teachers, includes believers as well as the lost. Many times we have the idea that unsaved people come and get into the church pretending to be Christians, pretending to be true believers in Jesus Christ, and then they come in for the purpose of destroying the work. And indeed, there are those individuals that I believe are being used by Satan, and they are not believers, and they'll come into the church for the purpose of destroying the work. Many times, many individuals that are into, uh, into occult worship and into Wiccan and so forth will do things to try to trip up or to cause Christians to fall or to fail, and so they would do something like that intentionally, uh, quite possibly, and that is a possibility. But I have to say that in a church where the Holy Spirit is present in believers and there is some discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit of God, that's not the best tool by Satan to cause division and to cause uh, Christians to fall and to fail in the church. The best tool that Satan has in our church is you and me. And the best opportunity he has to cause division and the best opportunity he has to cause 
uh, God's people to fail spiritually and to be rendered incapable of doing the work of the Lord is for us to fall into apostasy or to fall into false doctrine. And if you'll notice in verse 1 of, Je of Jude, you will find that James, uh, that Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, the latter is addressed to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. And so there's a threefold, uh, a threefold address here. First of all, sanctified means you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It means you've been saved by receiving Jesus as your Savior. And then it goes on to say, preserved in Jesus Christ. It means that Jesus has preserved you and that you've got the seal of the Holy Spirit. So you're saved, you're always saved. And then it goes on to say, and called. Not only have you been saved, but God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And here we find that the great danger for uh, the Christian, for the believer is that they could be hindered from that calling that God has placed in their life. Christian, I would encourage you to know your calling. I would encourage you to, first of all, know that you're called. God does not save without calling. That is exactly what Romans chapter 8 is talking about when it says, to whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, I can promise you that your calling has something to do with your being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You're predestinated... Uh, for anyone who is saved is predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So when you receive Jesus as your Savior, God's plan for you is for you to be like Jesus Christ, and you are called. Everyone who is saved has a calling, has a reason, has a purpose. You know, I, it, uh, when I talk to individuals that are without Jesus Christ, it's interesting to me uh, that they don't have a calling. It's interesting that they don't have a purpose in life, and I find that out by when they say, well, this is what life's all about. Well, this is the purpose of life. And they, and they come up with a variety of things. There's some general flows of thought that a lot of people would agree with, and then sometimes people have a uh, purpose in life that is you know, not the standard or not what people generally think. For instance, some people think it's their purpose in life to save trees or twigs or branches or figs or whatever. And there are people whose purpose in life is, and it's a little different than, if, if I were going to live for myself, it's a little different than what I think my purpose is, but it is not a God-given calling. And it's obvious, but they, and the reason for it is because they don't know Christ. And so uh, I just want to point this out to you this evening, and I want to look at a couple of ways that we can contend for the faith. And so one of the ways that we can contend for the faith, and I really don't want to dwell on this a great deal, but Jesus uh, and, and the Scripture warns believers of those individuals who have had great opportunity, who have failed, and have consequently come under judgment. And so there's a warning of judgment to those individuals that do not believe. And so I just want to uh, point this out. The first way that you and I are able to contend for the faith is, in, is by identifying ungodly men who bring God's judgment. The first way you and I as a Christian can fulfill the command in verse 3, which says, It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Verse 4 uh, expounds on that. It says, There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. And here are the things they do. They turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And it gives a lot of characteristics about these individuals. I just want to kind of tell you what they are, and you can study and look at it yourself. Don't want to focus on it this evening because it's not what our message is about. The first characteristic is, is that they are unbelieving. In verse uh, 5, uh, it talks about the, those individuals which were saved out of Egypt, the nation of Israel, who were destroyed because, according to the second part of verse 5, afterward, God, having saved the people of the land of Egypt, destroyed them that believed not. And so they were destroyed because of unbelief. Though they had seen God, though they had been delivered physically by God, though they had been provided for by God, yet they did not believe in God. And they did not trust God. And so as soon as God's presence is up on a mountain with uh, Moses, then they immediately they turned to another God. Because why? Because he was not their God. 
And so, uh, even though they had had access to God, they believed not. And I want to warn you, if you're here this evening and you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, uh, it is no different for you. Uh, you. You cannot say that you have uh, not seen God, you have not been delivered by God. The very fact that you and I are alive today, my friend, is by the grace of God. Every breath that you have, every heartbeat that you have, the life that is breathed into you is a gift of God. And so we would be the same if we made the choice to reject Jesus Christ as the nation of Israel who was sustained in the wilderness for 40 years. The sustaining of the nation of Israel in the wilderness was a miracle. It was a miracle. You cannot explain it by any stretch of the imagination with man's uh, unbelief the existence of a couple of million people in a place where one or two could not really exist, their shoes never wearing out, they're having food for 40 years, they're having water every time they needed it. You cannot explain God's deliverance of the nation of Israel, and yet those individuals that followed God by having a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, literally the visible presence of God leading and directing them, they did not believe. Friend, if they didn't believe, uh, then it's easy for us to understand how you and I could not believe. Many times, like, well, if we just had what they had. I mean, yeah, if I'd seen God part the Red Sea. No, friend, unbelief is the same. It is an unwillingness to trust Christ as your Savior. And if you're unwilling to do it, no miracle will convince you. No miracle would persuade you. You would just try to find a way to explain it away, and you would fit this description and come under God's hand of judgment. Second category is angels. The Bible says in verse 6 of Jude that the angels who had not kept, they which kept not their first estate. What was the angels' first estate, their first place where they dwelt? Heaven. I mean, what better place to start off than heaven? Right? I mean, are we not looking forward to the day when we will not be in bodies that, are, uh, that yield to sin, that have a desire for sin? I, I want to tell you something. The thing I look forward to in heaven more than anything else probably physically, the thing that I can understand about heaven more than anything else would be this having a body that does not want evil. Living in a flesh that's not sinful. Oh, hey, you, sometimes I've had Christians come in and say, hey, you know, I don't understand how we can want to worship God for thousands of years. Like the rest of our lives spending worshiping God and Jesus Christ. I mean, that just, I mean, I won't mind worshiping Jesus, but I mean, for thousands of years... Friend, you don't understand because you're in a flesh that worships itself. And that's what's natural for you, but you'll be removed from that. You'll be clothed with a new body. And it won't be any trouble at all wanting to do right because you won't be inhibited by sin. Well, that was the position the angels were in in heaven when they chose to follow Lucifer. And that's rebellion. That's unbelief. Now, you and I don't have to worry about that happening to us. Once you've believed in Jesus Christ, friend, there's no going back. And praise the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to worry about going to heaven and getting kicked out. But these angels began in heaven and made a choice of unbelief, and they were expelled. And so that's a second warning of judgment. Third warning of judgment, Sodom and Gomorrah, which because of wickedness, uh, because of wickedness, that city was destroyed, and that's in verse 7. And then, of course, there is a description of these individuals uh, that have crept into the church. And so here are those individuals that have come under judgment. And then verse 8 goes back to a description of these false teachers. And so I want to talk this evening about identifying ungodly men as well as how to contend for the faith or how to uh, keep from failing or falling. Well, first of all, an identification of these men is that they are filthy dreamers who defile the flesh. Now, what does this mean to defile the flesh? Well, simply this, they are not concerned about keeping their body the temple of the Holy Spirit. Anytime we talk about defiling the flesh, we come to the understanding that we are to glorify God with our body and our soul, which are God's. They belong to God. They're, they are, belong to Him. And an individual who defiles the flesh is an individual that's not concerned about their body being a temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, I do not believe that verse 8 is strictly limited to unbelievers. I believe it's possible for believers to defile the flesh. Uh, first of all, the scripture would not warn us about defiling our bodies or defiling the flesh if it were not a possibility. It would not be a possibility. But these would be dangers in the church. Christian, as kindly as we can be, uh, listen, we believe 
and, and, and separation. It's a Bible doctrine. We believe that you separate from false teachers, you separate from false doctrine. I believe in unity. 1 Corinthians talks about unity, but it talks about unity in sound doctrine. And when there's not sound doctrine, there cannot be unity. Someone believes something that is not what the Bible teaches, then you cannot be unified, and it makes it impossible. And one of the areas that causes there to be a lack of unity is when there is something crept into the church, which is the defiling of the flesh. Now, we could preach, could we not, all night about things that defile the flesh, things that defile the body? Uh, there are all kinds of things, but if you want to summarize it, just put it this way, sin. And these would be individuals that would have a disdain or a sneering attitude. They would look at sin and, as the proverb says, make a mockery of it, not think it's a big deal. And do you know that as, uh, as almost insane as it sounds, I have seen that in the church. I have seen individuals come into the church and make a mockery of sin and come and, and make light and make a joke of doing things that are wicked. And so this is a danger of individuals that would come into the church. Second uh, description of them is that they're rebels. The, the scripture says it this way, they despise dominion. Dominion is another name for lordship or rulership or someone being the boss over them. And it's not just church dominion it's talking about here. It's talking about dominion in general. You ever notice that a rebel doesn't have one cause? His only one cause is rebellion, but he doesn't have just one thing he's rebellious against. He'll be rebellious against his mom and dad, and then he'll go to school. If he's a young person, he'll be rebellious against his teachers. And then when he gets done being rebellious with his teachers, he'll go to job, his job or his workplace, and he'll be rebellious there. And then he'll go to jail, and he'll be rebellious there. And a rebel's a rebel no matter where he is, and he despises dominion. He's an individual that has a disdain for any kind of authority over him and will not recognize authority. Well, then the third thing, and by the way, have you seen it in the church? You know what, that, what they're branded as? Well, I just don't think that they have the right to do that. I mean, who makes, what is the pastor, why does he think he gets the right to make a decision for the whole church? By the way, pastor doesn't make decisions for the whole church in our church. We have church business meetings where our church makes decisions. But God has given the pastor the vision for the church and given him a certain authority in the church. And you know what? Uh, a person that comes in and says things like that, they probably don't know the whole situation. They don't know everything that goes on, but I'll tell you something, they despise authority. And they're going to have a problem with it. Well, who gives you the right? What authority do you have to tell me what authority? You cannot make me. You do not have the authority. They despise authority, and friend, this causes. This is one of the areas that, is, that we have to contend for in the faith, in the church. It's our job as believers to fight against these things. By the way, it's going to talk about how to deal with these things later on, and we'll see that, and it's in the part where we keep from falling. Then they speak evil of dignities. They don't have any trouble at all saying whatever they want to about whoever. And the best example, I think, of this in the scripture will be when the prophet is going up the mountain, Elijah. And the children, is Elisha or Elijah? Elijah is the bald one, right? Elijah. Yeah, Elijah's going up the mountain. And the children come out and they say, go up, thou bald head. Elisha. No, it was Elisha, yeah. Elisha. Yeah, it was one of the first things. And, and so, well, anyway, the prophet. I should have left it the prophet. Yeah, it was Elisha. And uh, so the she bears came out and ate them up. Uh, a, a good example would be when Moses had individuals saying, who made you our ruler? Who said you could be our... Now, is that an obvious question? I mean, did, 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 were the people unaware that God spoke to Moses in a burning bush? And Moses said, I don't want to do it. And God said, you have to. And Moses said, I can't do it. And he said, well, I'll send Aaron along. And God called Moses to be their leader. Who made you? And boy, they didn't have any trouble at all saying, oh, Moses just wants to... And, and Aaron just, and, and his boy, his brother and sister even joined it. My goodness, friend. And so I would warn you, friend, you and I must be careful. We have to be careful. Not to just say, well, this is something for people that are lost. This is just something for someone that's not saved. These are possibilities for a believer. And we have to remember this. We have to be careful about it. And we have to be watchful for it as well. I know many times, uh, and I look back on, on situations that have happened in my life, that I have been an ear for gossip. And I've listened to it. 
I've heard people go, you know, say, if you gossip, listen to gossip, it's the same as gossiping yourself, and that's true. But a lot of times, uh, I've fallen into it because I thought, well, it's a good Christian man. This is a good Christian lady. And, you know, they, I know they're talking about this, but it's because they want to do something about it, and it's because, you know, they, they're really concerned about it, and they're just good Christian people. And later on, I realize, you know what? They're just despising dignitaries. They're despising people that God has called and put in places. And they're looking at it, and they have no trouble at all. They have no qualms about talking about anybody. By the way, when you meet someone like that, just know this. If they don't mind talking about the people that you know, they're talking to the people that you know about you. And I, it's just a fact. They, there's no rules for them as far as uh, if I've gossiped to this person, I can't gossip about this person. You know what they like to do? They like to go to one guy and say that you said and then they like to go to you and say that he said, and get it going between the two of you and stir it up. And a whisperer separated very chief friends. You and I have to be careful about these things. And it's a possibility for believers as well. Then it talks about individuals. By the way, did you notice that Jude doesn't use kind language? See, the way we look at it, we think, boy, judgment and damnation, and they must be lost. Jude is a guy that doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't waste words. And the evidence of that is how long the book of Jude is. He gets the point across very, very quickly. And so he despised dignitaries, speaking evil of, and just, and that's it. But Christian, just because he's using harsh words does not mean it's not a possibility for you to be the one he's talking about and the one that the Holy Spirit is, is convicting about. Allow the Spirit of God to convict you if, if it fits. And then he says that they um, are living for this life, verse 11. And I'm not covering everything that could be here. But in verse 11... He uses the, this illustration. He says, woe unto them. He says, look out. Woe is a good word for saying judgment is coming, or you better look out. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perishing in the gainsaying of Korah. Well, what would these individuals have in common? They would have in common, both Cain and, and Balaam, for instance, that they cared about the things of this life and did not care about the precious things that pertain to eternal life. Here Cain is not concerned with whether God in heaven is pleased. He's concerned with whether or not he has um, positive peer pressure in this life. He's concerned about how his sacrifice is received on earth and he's bothered that somebody else on earth has gotten uh, God in heaven to be pleased by it. And Cain's concern, even when he's cursed and he has a mark on him, his concern is, I'm going to be driven from among men and anybody that finds me is going to kill me. And he's concerned about this life. But he's not at all concerned about standing before holy God as a murderer and having the blood of his brother Abel on his hands. Balaam is one of the best examples of someone who has great access to spiritual things. Here he is, a man who is a has the ability to be spoken to by the real God in a day and age when he would have stood alone as a prophet. Hey, he would have been the only one that God would just speak to. And it seems as though, if you study the life of Balaam, it seems as though at any time God would just talk to him very directly. I mean, God would just, if, if Balaam wanted to go and prophesy about a nation, he could go do it and God would give him a word about it. And here, here Balaam is willing to be a sellout of his very precious heavenly gift for earthly treasures. And he's very concerned about the things of his life, and he's willing to trade his eternal destiny for things that are in this life. And Christian, if you don't think that you are susceptible to the same thing, can I ask you what you're living for this week? If you don't think it's a possibility for you, can I ask you what your treasure is? Because Matthew chapter 6 says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Balaam's heart was here when he had access to things up here. Now, God prevented Balaam from cursing his people. He ended up having to bless his people, but Balaam was willing to curse them. He was willing to curse God's people, even though he had access to God. And that's one of the warnings and one of the identifications of a false teacher or a person who's crept in, the Bible says, unaware, that is causing, bringing damnation into the church. Now, they live for their, this life, and they are, uh, there are several other things that 
uh, talk about them, uh, the descriptions of them. Let's just read our way down. First of all, there are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, they have no concern at all to come in even to the Lord's Supper and just eat and drink to themselves damnation, and they do not care. Uh, they are, the Bible says, clouds, they are without water. Now, if you've ever been in a famine or in a drought and had a cloud pass overhead, you know the anticipation, the excitement, you know the hope that a cloud brings, and then it just passes right over. Now, I don't know about this, but a cloud without water could be someone that comes in the church and promises pastor all the things he's going to do and the church people and says, we're going to do this and this and this, and we've got all of these plans and all these things, and then you just don't ever see them, and they don't even attend. And they just, and they're gone. When we first started our church, we had, uh, you know, we, we were very glad for any visitor when we first began. We would just, a lot of times have just five of us here. And so when someone would come in the door because they got a door hanger or whatever, remember a lady called me on the phone and was so excited about a church like ours being here. And she read all this. I grew up in a church like yours. It's just what I've been looking for. It's where I need to be. And I'll be there Sunday. And came on Sunday. So I'll play the piano and I can do this and I can do that and all these things. And that was the last time she ever came to our church. The clouds without water. There's, they bring hope and they bring anticipation. But all they do is just basically cause those individuals that would fill the place to step aside. And then when they've stepped aside... Uh, there's just an empty hole because the place doesn't get filled. And so I would say that this would be church members that do not fill their position. They do not fulfill God's calling for them in the local church. And then it says, uh, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit. And so the fruit that they had is withering and dying and they're not producing anymore. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Now I... Uh, can only say this about this phrase, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And it's the same thing I said earlier, and that is that Jude stated things very, very strongly. But it could be that this twice dead phrase as well refers to the fact that they're physically dead and spiritually dead. Amen. Physically dead and spiritually dead. And what I mean by that is there's no life in them at all. They're not any good physically and they're not any good spiritually. Well, and then Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all. And then the last description is in verse 16. Murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And so these individuals uh, like to gripe, like to complain, uh, and... They're concerned about what people that can do something for them think, but not concerned about those individuals which cannot promote them, exalt them, or make something of them, and not concerned about what they think. And so the good thing about this, and it, though it happens in a small church, is that many times this will happen in a place where there are individuals that uh, people like this would think are great. And the good thing about not having any really great people, and I'm not saying you folks aren't great folks, but... Uh, you know, the lost would not say, oh, wow, look at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church and the people in it. What great people. Uh, what, they, uh, what these individuals uh, would do would be to look at a person and have them in admiration. And so, boy, if he's a big shot, they care. But if he's not, it doesn't matter what he thinks or what he does. And right and wrong, who cares? They, they just respect persons. And they're what uh, the book of James warns about. Now, I want to look at the... The, the, just we'll just read a couple more descriptions of them in verse 17 and 18. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Now here in my Bible between verse 18 and verse 19, I have a little drawn, a little line drawn, and I have an arrow pointing uh, toward the previous passages and an arrow pointing at the passages to come because now there's going to be a contrast between these false teachers and those individuals that are fulfilling verse 3 and the command in verse 3, which is to contend for the faith. And so the command or the exhortation to contend for the faith, this contending for the faith is against every person described between verses uh, 5 and 18, but the how-to is from verses uh, 19 on down. And so here's what you do. First of all, Speaking of these individuals, 
And it says, these be they, and this is, of course, talking of the negative still, these be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. And I want to point out to you this evening that the individual who desires to contend for the faith will be said in contrast with the individual who is, is not con or who is uh, not concerned about con or who is the one who is the object of what you're contending against, who's brought in this false teaching, this false doctrine, uh, this this damnation or damnable heresy into the church. This individual would there would be a contrast between one having the spirit and the other not having the spirit. Now. I do not believe that it's talking about the indwelling Spirit of God. Now, it, it might. I wouldn't argue it, wouldn't fight for it. But I believe that it's talking about a contrast between those individuals who are Spirit-filled and those who are not. Do you know that Jesus was very plain about harvest and about gathering? He said, the person that gathereth with me, he's with me. But the person that's not gathering with me, he's against me. He's, he's the one that scattereth. And do you know there aren't, there's no neutral in Christianity? There's no, I'm neither good nor bad. There's no hot nor cold. God judges lukewarm. And if you're not spirit-filled, friend, you're the opposite. You're not filled. So you're either spirit-filled or not filled. And I believe that's the contrast in verse 19. Because, see, look at this. It says, but ye, beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now, we could spend some time on this. How does a person build up themselves? Uh, the word building up is similar to the word that we use for the word perfecting or, um, or uh, edifying, building up in the faith. The word edifying, oikotomane, I build up the house, uh, is the same kind of a concept as this here building word. And if you are going to contend for the faith, you have to be built up in the faith. And so the idea here is, ye beloved. So here are those people. They're over here. They've crept in. Uh, and they, it's important that we have to contend against them. They've crept in. But the, our response is to build up ourselves on our most holy faith. And there are two keys in verse 20. First of all, building up in the faith. That is in the word of God. It's in the adding to your faith. 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about how to add to your faith. All the things that are supposed to be in us and remain so that we can be fruitful. Or if, so that in contrast, we don't have to be barren or unfruitful. And our job, Christian, our job of contending for the faith is not getting a good sniffer and going out around trying to smell out the troublemakers. Our job is to be spirit-filled. I'll tell you something, God's spirit in you, if you're a spirit-filled believer and you are being built up in the faith, and you're adding these things to your Christian faith that belong there, it will be a natural response for you to know where to contend. You won't have to go looking for trouble. God's Spirit uh, deals with the tender as well as the rebellious. Why, why am I going like this? this <laughs> you guys are on the left, and uh, we're a right-wing bunch of group, a bunch of people, so I don't understand. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but God's Spirit divides, doesn't it? I mean, this, when you're Spirit-filled, it just causes reaction. You, it, I would tell you something. You're filled with the Spirit. And God's, I'm talking about Spirit-filled where God is really working in you and out of you. You can say hello to someone and get two different reactions based upon what they are. They're Spirit-filled, you'll get a Spirit-filled response. They're tender and willing to be spoken to by God's Spirit, you'll get a uh, I, 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 you know, the, an appropriate response. But you know what? I'll tell you something. If they're the ones that have crept in unawares and you say hi, you'll get a response that shows you they're not spirit-filled. Just by saying hello. I mean, you don't have to go around looking for the trouble. Boy, somebody's causing trouble. There's trouble here. I'm going to find it. Somebody's sinning in our church, and I'm going to figure them out. God's Spirit knows. God already knows, and His Spirit knows. And if you're spirit-filled, you don't have to look. Yeah, by the way, why would you want to? I've met some Christians, I've met pastors, that think their job is to find out the sins of the people. You know what? That's God's job. It really is. That's your job to do right by people. You know about sin, you better deal with it scripturally. 
But it's not your job to go around and sense sin. But is there enough sin to keep us busy if that was our job? How could I ever preach the gospel if I had to go around and chase you down for your sin? Wouldn't have time for it. But I do have time to build myself up in the faith and to be spirit-filled. And so do you. So one of the first ways for us to contend for the faith and to keep from falling is the building up in the faith. You know, that just, just very naturally and very practically. Read your Bible. Just read your Bible. Read your Bible and say, God, I want you to talk to me. I want you to speak to me. You do that every day, it'll make a difference. it just make a world of difference. If you don't have time to read your Bible, you don't have time to pray, you'll find out what it's like to try to contend for the faith without the Spirit. If you want to be Spirit-filled, ask God. God, I want to be filled with your Spirit. Lord, these are the areas in my life that I recognize your Spirit has showed me that are sin. I confess them to you. And God, now today I give this day to you. I'm asking you to speak to me from your Word. Pray that prayer from your heart, and God, God will honor it. And he'll fill you with His Spirit. And then um, it says that we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. Now, this is one of those commands that if you stop reading at verse 21, would seem like it's very, very hard. Has anyone here ever failed? I asked this at the beginning. Has anyone here ever failed, even spiritually? And I'd say we're all at some time, at some point, spiritual failures. And so when you're a failure, it's particularly when you're in the place of failure. And you have a command in the Bible that says, keep yourself in the love of God. Your question is, how? How? And then, immediately comes to your mind, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, these, and all these infirmities of the flesh, and that which I would, I do not. That which I would not, that I do. I find then a law that to will is present in me, but to do that which is good I find not. And it's like, oh, how in the world can I keep myself in the love of God? Well, glad you asked. Look down to verse uh, 24. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? By keeping yourself near God and he'll keep you. See, this keeping is a will, and the answer to this will or this desire is draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. God is not going to keep you from failing when you want to fail. And so there is, of necessity, a command to your will. God is not going to make you be holy He's going to command you to be holy and equip you to do so. But see, you do not get the equipping without the will to do it. That's why Christians struggle with victory over sin. It, that is exactly the reason why Christians struggle with victory over sin. They pray and say, God, make me stop sinning. And God says, you want to sin. That's what you want. Tell me that when you commit a sin that you've been struggling with, that God's Spirit does not warn you before you do it. That you do not have conviction for it. You do. And you sin anyway. Why? Because you want to. If you didn't want to, God would help you not to. But if you want to sin, you will. And that's why the command here is important. God's going to give you the power to do it. He's going to give you the power to do it when it's what you want to do. And somehow we think that giving God a mandate to do something that we don't want Him to do, He's going to do it. That's kind of a confusing statement. But it simply means this. In my heart, I want to sin. But I don't want to have the consequences of sin, so I say, God, keep me from sinning. In my heart, I want to. I'm willing to have God stop me from it if He can. And so I give Him permission to stop me from sinning. But it's not really what I want. And God is a gentleman. And he does not always bully us and force us to love him. He does not force us to do his will. Now, thank God for some of the th things that he spared us from. Thank God for the times when he's kept us from doing what we were willing to do. Or going the direction that we were willing to continue in. And God in His mercy chastised us and brought us to a place that protected us from those things. 
But do you understand the passage here? Keep yourself in the love of God first, and then God will keep you. You've got to get your want to fixed. God, I don't want to sin anymore. If you want some help with that? Go ahead and expose your sin. Expose it for what it is. Go ahead and take it all the way to the consequences of it. Go ahead and call it exactly what it is. We have such polite names for sin. We make it sound like such a nice thing a lot of the time. This fellow struggles with, and we have nice names for whatever he struggles with. He struggles with alcoholism. And I don't want to get, you know, the ranting preacher. I don't really like that myself. But uh, he doesn't struggle with alcoholism. He's a drunk. And a drunk's an ugly word. Drinking's an ugly thing. And alcohol is disgusting all the way. It's just a sick, disgusting thing. It smells, it stinks, it's filthy, it's vomit. The critters don't even naturally like it. You've got to start them drinking it before they can develop a taste for it. And you started yourself drinking it when you didn't even like it. And it's just, a, and, and alcoholism is not the word for it. It's booze, it's, it's drunkenness. Well, you know, I mean, he really struggles with, um, really has a hard time with drugs. What, crack? Pot? Well, just call sin what it is. You know, you know what pot makes? It makes potheads. You know what crack makes? Crackheads. You know what a prescription drug abuse makes? It makes a bunch of druggies. And go ahead and call it what it is. And say, God, I don't want to be a druggie, not Lord. Help me to have victory over these pills. You know, a lot of times we think, you know, well, you know, people just don't understand the need of my flesh. I really need this, and I know it's bad, and it causes bad things to happen and all this, but I really need it. And so I'm going to, friend, you've got to call sin what it is to be kept in the love of God. And that will keep you if you allow him to. And then the second, then it gives a, an appropriate response. Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do you do it? And how do you deal with these false teachers? And we'll be finished. First of all, you deal with false teachers. Some of them, you deal with them compassionately. You deal with them compassionately. I don't know about you, but one of the things that helps me to be compassionate is to understand that but for the grace of God, there go I. I can be compassionate to someone that I say is, is uh, no worse than I am. And truly, there is no saved sinner who's any worse than you and I are. There's no saved sinner who's worse than you and I are. Because but for the grace of God, Pastor, I would never do what they would do. No, but you'd do something that God views as just as terrible. And so your immediate response to false teaching, false doctrine is compassion. And do you know that this is a good and appropriate response that does work? You know, there's a big difference between somebody who goes to someone who is wrong because of sin, wrong because of false teaching, wrong because they've got their focus off of eternity and their focus is on this life, wrong for whatever reason. There's a difference between and, and the response of someone whom you go to in compassion. You have to understand that a person who is in these sins that is described is first of all facing terrible judgment. And one of the things that helps me with compassion more than anything else is to see judgment for someone else. I don't like to see people hurt. And when somebody is going to have judgment with the description of Sodom and Gomorrah, with the description of the angels in heaven, uh, fitting the description of uh, those, the children of Israel whose carcasses died in the wilderness, I don't know about you, but I'm not happy about that. It doesn't make me happy to see them being destroyed. And do you know that the individual who is bringing false teaching, who is a predator in the church, for whatever reason, do you know that they will be judged? They absolutely will. And so your coming to them is not a concern that, boy, they better get what they deserve. They will get what they deserve, my friend. Your coming to them ought to be with, I hope they don't get what they deserve. And it'd help you a lot to forgive if you could understand that. If you understood the value that God holds towards you, you're valuable to God. Now, the proof of that is that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for you. God loves you. Amen. And you ought to learn to find your worth and your value, not in what you accomplish, not in how good you are, but in the fact that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. You're valuable. Amen. 
Amen. You're not valuable because of your talents, your abilities, your skills. No, God gave you all those things, and that's nothing to be uh, consider yourself special for. That's just what God gave you. But God loves you, and that makes you very valuable. If you would understand that, it would help you a lot with forgiveness as well. You wouldn't have trouble forgiving somebody because many times we want to hold judgment towards someone as a way of proving that we're worth whatever. It's a self-esteem issue, and God doesn't is not interested in self-esteem. Self-esteem is a major false doctrine that hurts people terribly because you look at yourself as being valuable for things that aren't valuable. That's amazing what people have self-esteem for. You know, you go to uh, the kids' child, children's sports leagues now, and every child's a winner. Yay, he got out. Yay, he missed the ball. Yay, he's so clumsy. Every kid's a winner. That's ridiculous. Uh, listen, it doesn't work in the pros, and it's not real in the junior leagues either. You know, they don't, you know, you know, I mean, he's got the worst record, and so he's valuable. You know, he's a winner, and so we're going to put him on our team. Now you want somebody that produces, and that makes him valuable. The self-esteem movement does the opposite. It's like, oh, you're a little bit slow on that area. Okay, well, just believe in yourself. You know, believe that that's good. Well, it's not good. What's good is that Jesus Christ loves you. And that gives you infinite value, and there's, there's nothing more valuable than the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm covered by it. And so I'm very precious in the eyes of God. God's saints are precious in his eyes, very precious. And that's what you ought to find your value in. Well, if you do that, then you won't have trouble uh, being compassionate towards someone when you recognize that they're going to come under judgment and that you're really no different except for that you're keeping yourself in the love of God and God is keeping you. And then the Bible says about others, it says others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. This is the one that you've got to get a little more personal with, I suppose. It goes more about, more than, you know, you're, you're trapped in sin, and I'm sorry for that. That's a compassionate approach. In other words, it's a terrible thing to be trapped in sin, isn't it? How many of you want, love being ensnared with sin and having, struggling with the victory? No, it's a terrible thing. We ought to have compassion toward those that want to have victory. But some individuals don't want to have victory. And they've got a kind of a hardened attitude of, well, this is the way the cookie crumbles. This is the way it's going to be. And so God's just going to have to judge me. Go ahead and tell them about judgment. Go ahead and preach hell to them. Go ahead and tell them, you know what? If you stand before God in your sin. You know, I've, I've started doing this. and I, I, just, I really pray to be spirit-led in it. But um, I don't talk to people. I don't give the gospel to people that don't want to hear it. If I try to witness to somebody and they say, I don't want to hear it, then I just leave them alone. I've always really had that policy. I don't just argue with people. If, if I'm going to talk to somebody who's lost, I'm going to talk to them about their soul. I'm not going to discuss all the doctrines they've got a problem with in the Bible. I'm not going to talk to them about they don't like this about the church. and that. Their issue is they need to be saved. And so I'll talk to them about that. But I don't argue with them about other things. But do you know when I leave somebody and they say they don't want anything to do with God and they hate Jesus Christ and all these things, do you know that I have stopped just walking away? I usually, first of all, say, why? What's your problem with God? And then I just say this. I say, you know what? You're going to stand before him someday. And you'll be judged. And you'll either have the righteousness of Christ, and Jesus will have your sin. Or you'll stand in your sin, and you'll be damned to hell for eternity. You know what? You don't have anything to lose with somebody that hates God and won't give you an audience. And so that would be the say with fear. Be nice about it. You can say that and you can be as compassionate as possible, but sometimes things just need to be said because, friend, they will burn in hell. And that's terrible. And I'd rather they went to heaven and thought I wasn't nice. A lot of people don't think I'm nice. I can do nice things and have people... Tell, ask my wife. I can do nice things and have people think I'm not nice. I get judged that way all the time anyway. And so, you know... Just go ahead and tell them the truth as kindly as you can, as compassionate as you can, because they will stand before God and they will be judged. God judges every sin, every sin that's ever been committed in this entire world from the beginning of the first man until the last man will be judged. There has never been a sin that's ever escaped. You know, if you're better at God and you say, if God's good, then why did he let this person? He didn't let them. 
Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin if they're a Christian. And Jesus got judged. God didn't let them get away with it. Jesus went to the cross for it, first of all. But if they die and they stand in their sins, they will answer to God. They'll burn in hell forever for it. What more do you want from them? You want a pound of their flesh too? All sin gets judged. That's a serious matter. And we ought to take judgment seriously. And we ought to save people by fear. And the Bible says, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Just hate sin. Christian, we have brought political correctness into the church, but it didn't come out of the Bible anywhere. Jesus is not politically correct. He said, if you follow me, people are going to hate you because they hated me. And that's politically incorrect. And I just want to tell you something. You've got to hate sin. Even the garment, the Bible says, spotted by the flesh. If it's a representation, it's not the sin. It's not the sinner. It's something that has to do with the sin. Get it out. How much leprosy do you want in your shoes? How much athlete's foot is okay in your shower? Only mine, folks. <laughs> oh, it's, my wife and I stayed in the guy's house last week, and I've been wearing um, sandals in the shower. And so I'm not telling you why, just because I'm cautious. I'm just careful and touchy about those things. I'll tell you how much is okay, not a bit. Maria came back from Cambodia. She said she washed her shoes before she put them in her suitcase. You know, how much of an infectious disease is okay? you know, on, on your pen, or in your food, or on your cup? None, right? Well, it's just a little bit. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Clean out. Clean it up. And you know, that's how much is okay in the church. How much sin is okay in the church? Not even the traces. Pastor, that would eliminate all of us. No, friend. We're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can take care of your sin. You know, it's not okay to come, have sin in your life, and not deal with it. When God's Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, you know why? Because He wants you to get right. You know when He wants you to get right? When He talks to you. He does not speak to you so you can hear Him. Have you ever heard that something's sin and said, Okay, God, you've convinced me about that. I'll have to think about it. Probably have. And that is not hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. It doesn't matter if this is a hindrance in my life, this is a hindrance in our church, and I've got to cut it out. I've got to get it out. And so this is the way that you and I are able to contend for the faith and to keep from falling. You know, you don't want to be a soldier without having the power of the Spirit. A lot of Christians are going out and they're contending for the faith, and they're contending for the faith with the strength of the flesh, and you won't be able to do it. But the secret to contending for the faith is to keep yourself in the love of God. It is to build up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And if you'll do that, it'll be natural to follow the leading of God's Holy Spirit. It'll be natural for you to be right with God. And it'll be natural for you to deal with sin. And it really comes down to this. The mandate, the command to deal with false teachers really comes down to a command for you to be right with God, to be in fellowship. Christian, it's just not okay to be out of fellowship. Because if you're out of fellowship, I'll tell you what will happen. Instead of being the one contending for the faith, you'll be the one that the faith is contending against. Boy, it ought never to be that way. That's not God's plan. It's not His design. Heavenly Father, help us to contend for the faith. And Lord, help us to keep ourselves pure and clean and hate even the garments that are spotted by the flesh. We ask for your help in this matter. Convict us about it. Make it very apparent to us how we should live. God, I pray that if there would be any area in our lives where there would be uh, specifics that your Holy Spirit would reveal to us tonight, saying that this is an area where we are spotted or we are unclean, that you would allow us this evening to have the conviction, to have the Bible answers, to know for sure that something is sin, and so that we could confess it, and we could have forgiveness. And God, I ask you would help us to understand this concept of keeping ourselves in your love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.